Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the frisky astronomy podcast, mm -hmm. where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and the trivia is theoretical. We are Strange Charm and Top the Astroporks, also known as Josh Caldwell, Addy Dove, and Jim Cooney. Coming to you from physically but not socially distanced locations near the University of Central Florida, remember to check out our website to see how to get our snazzy shirts and, and subscribe to us on all platforms, including YouTube, where you can see the actors whom we have hired to play us. <laughs> our stumpers today are energetic. Actors. Yes. Ooh. Yeah, no, we spent a lot of time casting these people oh, yeah. if you're watching us on YouTube now. And you'll see just, you know, why. This is like I Brad think... Pitt, Angelina Jolie type stuff that we've got here. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, and then somebody looks like Jim Cooney. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Paul Giamatti or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Paul. <laughs> Thanks. Oh man, that would be amazing. <laughs> yes, that's our that's our casting: Brad Pitt, Angelina, and Paul Giamatti. Uh, well, <laughs> our stumpers today are energetic, Addy, uh, for no particular reason. Okay. But uh, wind or solar? Um, energy sources uh, are these things. These things are energy sources. Um, they could also be spacecraft. There's a wind spacecraft and a, I don't think there's a solar, just solar, oh. solar probe, solar probe plus. But there's the Parker um, Solar Probe Parker and solar wind probe. is an acronym for something that's orbiting the earth and measuring solar wind. The wind. Oh, yeah. the solar yeah. wind. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's like waves experiment. Um, I like, well, I have solar panels on my house. I know. I'm partial to solar panels for my power, but I really think wind power is super cool, and I love dri driving and seeing like big fields of wind turbines. Um, these, these wind turbines now are insane. They're so crazy. Like the even when you're driving through the fields, you just have no idea of the scale of them until like a truck drives by you. So I've driven. There's like big ones in Kansas. I've driven through, and there was some. There's some out. Um, in Mojave near uh, space or where they used to fly at a spaceport for or not, not spaceport, but where anyway, in Mojave. Um, and you then you like a truck pulls up next to you and it's like a segment of a wind turbine and it's like a full semi truck. <laughs> well, and I was just, like... yeah, I was just out as you know, at spaceport, in fact, oh, yeah. not Mojave, but spaceport, New Mexico, spaceport America last week. Uh, for a launch attempt of one of our experiments. And as happened on the previous time I was out there, there was a convoy of wind turbine blades oh, going man. down I-25 and semi, forget about it. This is three yeah. times easily or four times bigger than a semi, a very specialized truck for each blade. Yeah. And the blade is this beautifully engineered aerodynamic shape. And at the end, you know, it gets very floppy, you know, it's sort of like an airplane wing, but much mm -hmm. longer and more tapery and uh, floppy at the end. Yes. Uh, so anyway, it's long, tapered yeah. and floppy, Jim. And, uh, but those were insane to see those driving down the road. Uh, and, you know, yeah. this whole huge production just to like get them for one of these giant turbines. But anyway, what did you choose in the end? So I think I choose wind. You choose wind. Okay, Jim. Yeah. Your choices are a little bit more on the esoteric side, Ooh, though we cover all of these in my class, <gasps> uh, Energy, Climate Change, and the Environment. Uh, Terrific class. Go sign up. Tidal or geothermal? Mm. Mm. I will choose to interpret these uh, in <laughs> what would happen if you went nuts on them. If you did okay. tidal then you'd screw up the ocean currents and all the fishes would die. And if you did too much geothermal, you'd cool off the Earth's core and the... Uh, <laughs> I don't, that's going... I, that, I think you'd have to go a little bit more nuts than even like the usual realm of going nuts to <laughs> cool off the Earth's core. <laughs> you cool the Earth's core. You, you lose your magnetic field, then we'd be in a lot of trouble, right? No, no, no. Geothermal was, is not from the no. core. Well, it's it's from the mantle. <laughs> it's the from geotherm. underneath. I um, mean, 
I did very, very much enjoy uh, the trip I once got to take to Iceland. I was very lucky to get to go there, whereas uh, uh, they have a significant portion of their energy is geothermal uh, because they're immediately above a hot spot and it was friggin' awesome. So I'm going with that. Yeah. Geothermal. So the wind, and as, as students of my class well know, uh, mm -hmm. wind and solar are both ultimately derived from the sun, the, the ultimate energy source that pushes the air around that gives us wind power is the sun. And the uh, obviously that's the case with solar power as well. But whereas geothermal and uh, tidal are unusual because they're coming from these other much, 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 much smaller energy sources. So how does Not that- Not if you're on IO. That's true. <laughs> if I were on IO, I would not have said that. I would choose tidal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, on here on the Earth, so geothermal, we've got this, you know, hot stuff in the interior of the planet that's, yeah, we you do. know, you can tap into that, not just on this show. No, and also in the interior. The also planet. in the interior, right. Uh, so how does the tidal thing even work, though, Jim? You were commenting about screwing well, up. Well, it's, 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 it's how do the tides it's, work? They go I, yeah, in, they go I, out. I, I Nobody can explain that. Right. Uh, tides, it's crazy. The, the water on the earth sloshes back and forth because of uh, the, the, the effect of the moon and uh, or the difference in the moon's gravity across the earth. And then there's big giant turbines under the, uh, in the water that make use of the movement of the water as it goes back and forth. Uh, but of course, as you're doing that, you're stealing a little bit of the, you know, obviously you're stealing a little bit of energy from the water, which means that uh, that, that does change the uh, you know, global flow of water just a little bit. Uh, I think you could actually screw up kind of local environments, undersea environments. Oh, I'm sure. Um, if you're if you're taking a lot of energy out of a system, you're going to screw something up somehow. Or right. Other. You're right. Gonna, there's I would be think it'd be easier to screw up local systems by by doing the the, the tidal stuff than geothermal stuff. But I could be mistaken. About I think you're idea. right. There are some other interesting ways that you can get energy from the ocean. Uh, one is from just the wave action. So you can put yeah. hinged things that are floating on the surface of the ocean and as the waves make them uh, bend, that you can steal some of that bending and turn it into electricity. Well, that's, uh, neat, that's, that's like a combo of stealing energy from the tidal thing and stealing energy from the sun. It's yeah, yeah. it's primarily, that's primarily driven by sun and wind, yeah. by wind, which is coming from the sun. But then there's another way, which is that there's a temperature gradient between the deep ocean in the surface ocean and mm -hmm. you can make some sort of fancy giant floating thing in yeah. warm ocean waters and have a reservoir you know something that goes down into the cold waters at the uh, very deep and you can use that temperature difference to drive uh, an electrical plant as well so uh, there and you know of course you're sticking a big thing in the ocean you're going to be pumping some uh, thermal energy essentially into that deep part which also has some consequences nothing is consequence free but uh, yeah you know. there's some interesting technologies that are that are different for like spacecraft that are, instead of using those thermal gradients use like electrical gradients uh to try to get energy for little spacecraft and stuff like that too they're fun well i, I hadn't realized this when i first started working on things like uh, voyager a long long time ago so so long ago it was in a different millennium <laughs> uh, <laughs> not that but, hard uh, but but the uh the radioisotope thermoelectric generators are yeah. basically powered by a thermal difference so that's yeah. this uh the uh radioactive decay of the plutonium makes this electric this uh, metal boundary between two different types of metal puts a temperature difference on that boundary and it drives an electrical potential across there Anyway, yeah, it's funny. You, you hear that like spacecraft have nuclear power on them, but it's actually just like little tiny pellets that are just creating heat, and heat. that heat difference is right. what causes it's, does the energy for the spacecraft, and it warms not, up your it's instruments. Not, uh, so. Yeah, it's not fission and fusion. It's not the kind of yeah, thing. right. Yeah. Nuclear power yeah. plants, but we hear nuclear power and we think, oh, it's a big nuclear power plant, and there's going to be a meltdown or anything. But <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. something warm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's some cool new technology working on making that more efficient too, because it's not super efficient. Right. So right. Uh, but speaking of those nuclear powered spacecraft and Voyager, Voyager 2, we're talking to it again. There was a year Yay. of silence from the Earth, the DS uh, Deep Space Network uh, antenna in Canberra, Australia Canberra. has been upgraded and uh, is able to talk to Voyager, which is now 
44. How old is it? Good grief. It was launched in 1977. That requires big math for me. 44 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> so it's More crazy. than me. Yeah. Uh, well, today we'll talk about things completely different. In fact, Yay. we're going to talk about hairy black holes. Oh, my. Double holes in Germany. Maybe also we'll throw in some astronomy and astrophysics. You know, it could happen. It could, could happen. happen on the Frisky Astronomy Podcast. But first, this episode of Walk About the Galaxy is brought to you by the Planck Constant. Whether you want to know the energy of a photon or the quantum increment of angular momentum, use the Planck Constant. This versatile quantity has been helping us discretize the universe for 120 years, doing away with the notions of continuous variables and atoms and light. But that's not all. If you're beating your head against the wall, trying to get your measurements of position and velocity exactly correct, let the Planck constant save you from pointless grief and frustration by showing you that that is just not possible with our optional Heisenberg uncertainty principle available for a nominal additional cost. With units of action, you won't want to be caught with a pla without the Planck constant wherever you're spinning, vibrating, or making any kind of venture into the quantum realm. The Planck constant. Don't leave home without it. MasterCard? I feel like that's right. You're both going with MasterCard? Carl uh, Malden, American, right? Express. American Express. American Express? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I said it just before you did. You did say it, Jim. Right. I heard you. Credit. Was it before? I said Carl Malden, though, before he said American Express. Do you know who Carl Malden is, Jim? He's an old guy, an old actor. <laughs> <laughs> He's not playing you on the podcast. Do either no, of you remember? Do either of you remember traveler's checks? American Express yes, traveler's checks? I, okay. I do. My, I, my family used to use those, bring those on trips all the time when I was younger. Yeah. Cool. I've heard of them. Well, <laughs> I, I, we used them too. Yeah. Our early, in our cash. early, yeah. in our early transatlantic trips. Uh, mm -hmm. So space news where it's, we've been talking about the, the, all the excitement with the Mars missions. Mm -hmm. Two of those missions have successfully arrived. Yep. And Woo, still uh, waiting on the third. Yeah, but just days away uh, and is scheduled to make its uh, landing on Mars the day after this podcast will be published uh, on the 18th. And on our next episode, we will have, uh, Addie and I will have a fellow Laspian. Yeah. Jim will yeah. have him also, but he's not a fellow Laspian for Jim <laughs> uh, from the University of Colorado, uh, Professor David Breen, whom we will, I'm sure, only and always refer to as either Professor Brain or <laughs> Doctor Brain. Doctor Brain. Doctor Brain. Uh, I've we'll never be on heard our that as a surname before. That's fantastic, especially as a physicist. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So yeah. uh, we'll Come be joined on. by we'll be joined by Doctor Brain. Yes. Uh, to talk about the Mars Hope mission on our next uh, episode. Um, we. Um... There's been some super cool photos that have come back from Hope, and then there's there were some cool videos I saw uh, from the Chinese orbiter that like were from when they did orbit insertion, yeah. and like you see, and it's from it's like they were imaging the solar panels on the spacecraft and something else on the spacecraft, but you like see Mars come into view in the background, and it's like you can see craters, you can tell yeah. that there's an atmosphere. It's awesome. And then the, when the engines are firing, you can see that like the oh, panels yeah. are. Yeah. shaking around as the end as the uh, yeah that's very cool um other space news there's a launch tonight which with any luck uh we'll be able to see out our back window yeah it scrubbed uh, last night because of our weather crazy weather here um which to be fair is much better than everywhere else in the country basically at the moment yes um this is yet again more uh starlink satellites from spacex which now owns more than one third of all of the operational satellites in Earth orbit, uh, Easy. which is pretty amazing, uh, considering that a few years ago there weren't any yeah. of these things in orbit. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, the number of satellites in orbit has grown significantly just with this one project. There are well over a thousand uh, of these yeah. satellites now. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where like it's not surprising to think that like someday in the future there was going to be just like hordes of satellites doing these kinds of things and we think about i think a lot of times when people talk about the fact that there are satellites overhead and we have all these gps satellites and all these satellites everybody thinks that it's like crowded 
And a lot of times we think that's enhanced by like a movie where it shows you satellites sort of near each other. But in reality, they're so far apart that like most of them never really see each other. Occasionally one will be able to snap a pic of each other, but that's yeah. like super rare. Um, but, and even like our little CubeSats, when they launch all together, they launch and they're separated by enough velocity that they're actually like pretty far apart from each other, even when they launch. Um, but there's going to be yeah. a lot of crap up there soon. Yeah. The other thing about <laughs> like not only space big and the satellites generally small, even in this sort of, you know, we say, we, we say, oh, it's getting crowded up there. But as you said, Addie, it's, it's really still pretty empty. And the things that do come close to each other typically are moving at about the same speed as each other. So yeah. the close approaches are generally leisurely. Yeah. I want to see, yeah. Josh loves to do back of the envelope calculations. I want to see what are the odds if you just launched a ship from Earth that's say 10 meters by 10 meters in cross-sectional area, what are the chances that it would hit something as it leaves low Earth orbit? Just, it's just going straight up in straight interplanetary. Out. What are yeah. the chances that it's going to hit something? Yeah. Oh, I can what answer. What are the I odds, can, Josh? I, I can, I, I'll tell you what the odds are. They're awesome. astronomical. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, I, yeah. I can figure that one out in my head, no problem. Astronomically small. Astronomical. Yeah, when, uh, when they do satellite launches to like put satellites in specific orbits, they do have to sort of plan what those orbits are going to look like. Um, and like, especially, I mean, so especially if they're constellations, they have to sort of plan on when they're going up. But like, even for other things, they have to like know where things are going to be and they try to launch them so that they're not like right on top of another one. But yeah, if you're just going like out to the moon or something, you yeah, be yeah. mostly fine. Out to the moon. All I know is I learned from the movie Gravity that everything hits everything else uh, hits <laughs> up in orbit, and it's very dangerous. Well, I'm sorry yeah. that that was your takeaway from that movie, but it's not <laughs> surprising. That was, that was the wrong title for that movie. It still bothers me. Yeah. Yeah. The um, the the other th uh, more seriously though point to your uh, question, Jim, is that the satellites are not uniformly distributed up there. Right. So they're you know it's not just like this shell of asteroids they're in various belts and bands and clustered in various inclinations and distributions so there are some regions where your odds would be considerably higher that you would run into something depending on which direction you're going uh, compared to others um, but definitely the low earth orbit realm which is where these spacex starlink satellites are just a few hundred kilometers up i mean if if you could drive there, just a few hours drive, right, to get to most of these satellites, uh, space isn't that far away. Right. <laughs> it's a right. tough drive. It's a tough drive to make <laughs> <Yeah>. it there, <laughs> but it's not. It's not so far. Yeah. One of the things that always strikes me anytime I see pictures of Earth from space is like, space is really close to us. It's like yeah. the atmosphere is really freaking thin. Yeah. Kind yeah. of freaks me out. Really right. freaks space me out a little bit. Like when the astronauts are flying overhead, they're closer to us than like somebody in LA they're closer than your you know your family in another state you yeah. Know. yeah yes <laughs> uh even though they're in space so yeah. anyway yeah. uh so that's our space news it's still harder to visit yeah you had some physics news Addy that was kind of up our alley oh I did there was an article I saw and let me let me check it to to get this right that there um it was a it was a tension grabbing headline because it said doubly strange nucleus observed. Um, and so this is about a strange quarks. Uh, so there's some particle physicists who are always studying particles, it turns out, um, <laughs> making things up all the time. I know. Uh, but so they were looking at, um, I think this is in Japan, uh, and it's in the Japan Proton Accelerator Research Complex. So this is one of those accelerators where they run things into each other and see what's made. Um, and they found a short-lived particle, a um, short-lived nucleus that had two strange quarks, um, which is uh, different because of... It was two stranges and a down, and right? And a down, that's right, yeah, yes. So it's an SSD. So that's not, that's not the entire nucleus, that's like one of the particles. In the one nucleus. of the particles. Yeah, they called them hype. <laughs> Hyperons. I wanted to say Hyperion, but that was so. So that, that that SSD thing is some sort of it, like an analogous thing would be a proton or a neutron, 
Mm-hmm. And what's a what's an, a proton is a what's a proton, Jim, and a neutron? So protons and neutrons are two ups and a down, or two downs and an up. And I always uh, okay. get them mixed up. Which one is which? Um, so, but ups up and, and down quarks though. are the uh, are the the common quarks. Almost everything that we know of is made of those two quarks, up and downs, because almost everything is protons and neutrons. Yeah. Um, but the less, yeah, the lesser known ones are called, are these ones called hyperons and then they have a strange quark in them. Yeah, you can have a strange, I mean, in theory, you can make nuclear particles like that out of also strange quarks and charm quarks and uh, bottom quarks and top quarks, but uh, they tend to be very rare and unstable because those things are hard to make in nature. So yeah. having a, a nuclear particle with a, with a strange quark, freaking freaking awesome. And then, and then I think what they did, Eddie, correct me if I'm wrong, is they like, made a nucleus or part of a new nu- some kind of a nucleus with one yeah. of those and then like some other regular parts of like a nickel nucleus or something like that i don't N- I nitrogen remember. i think i think it was a nitrogen, nitrogen nucleus yeah, something, something and something like, like yeah one of these ssd uh hyperons sort of glommed onto a regular sort of normal uh nitrogen nucleus yeah for some real sh- real short period of time but yeah why does uh putting a strange quark into the mix make it short-lived and unstable that's like make, it's feeling so strange. A bit... that's what happens right hmm? when, you, when you show up to a party isn't that what happens? i know that i know that's what i'm like all of a sudden it's... worried about <laughs> uh, uh i show up everybody leaves mm-hmm. <laughs> uh it, no but is there some fundamental property of the strange quarks are held together by gluons well, everything is, I mean, all, all things in nuclei are held together by gluons, the strong nuclear force, but the, uh, these things decay very, very quickly because of the weak nuclear force. Um, and uh, I mean, so anyway, they're, they're very, I mean, they're, they're extremely massive and unstable. And when you, you try to make nuclei with them, they just decay immediately. Uh, but that tells you some interesting things about fundamental physics when, when you can actually see these things and watch them decay. Okay. tells you about how, get... how, how strange quarks decay into other things, what the, the, the decay processes and all this kind of stuff. I don't know. I'm not a particle physicist anymore than you guys. So I don't know. But <laughs> it's, uh, I was just trying to get cool. to whether or not We need to play that a... game to figure it out, Josh. That's right. My, my nephew, Professor Kit Caldwell, uh, has invented an amazing uh, particle physics game uh, <laughs> where <laughs> you, it is awesome. you will learn all particle physics when you play that game. Yep, all, all of it. collider. Yep. yep. Um, yep. I was what I was really trying to get at though was whether or not there was the germ of an idea for a science fiction novel, bestseller movie, one of these things where there's some pl- world that's all made out of strange bearing subatomic particles. Starring yeah. Brad Pitt, I mean, Angelina Jolie, and, and Paul, Paul Giamatti. Giamatti. Paul Giamatti, of course. Right. <laughs> natural pairing yeah exactly. okay so what you're saying though is that all the universe is made out of quarks that are not strange charm or top pretty yeah much. I, I think it is theoretically possible to have uh, stable things made out of strange quarks but uh typically it's not going to be mixed with the other normal quarks because i think those okay. yeah mixes are and these stable. were doubly strange which is extra rare Okay. Well, we had a, we had a bunch of news, and so I, I'm going to mix things up a little bit on you guys. I'm going to introduce the trivia to you now, and then we'll okay. we'll cover our hairy black holes, and then we'll also talk about hairy you black really holes. Yeah. Yeah. You should always cover keep your hairy black holes covered up, but we'll cover them uh, after I tell you what the trivia is. Uh, so, <laughs> our trivia is one of the list format of trivia. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read you a list of eight theorems, just the names, not okay. the theorems themselves, the names. Five of them are real. Three of them are not. Three and fake you, theorems. You are are challenged. Theorems, theorems in physics, theorems in math, or just general? Any, Ma- any of math. Math theorems, okay. Yeah. I think if it's called a theorem, pretty much it's got a, it's math. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, but they're not they're not like space theorems or anything like that. These are math theorems, or okay. from the the twisted strange brain. Uh, here here they are: the hairy ball theorem, the high dive theorem, the palm frond theorem, the ham sandwich theorem, 
the ugly duckling theorem, the non-squeezing theorem, the squeeze theorem, the court jester theorem. Huh. Five of those <laughs> are honest to God, real theorems. Real theorems. And the other three are not. Where I was like trying to come up with something that wasn't, you know, <laughs> that's weird as the real ones. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, so I that's your you challenge. To fully explain all of these theorems once. Uh, oh, I will. Yes, of course. Yeah. You'll get a full advanced math course at the end of the show when we reveal which of those are real. <laughs> um, yes. Well, speaking of the Harry Ball theorem, mm -hmm. let's talk about Harry Black Holes, Jim okay. Cooney who I immediately think of anytime somebody mentions Harry Black Holes. Excellent. Um, yeah, so let's talk about the, let's talk about, the, let's comb a little bit of this hair around this black hole. That, there's, a, there's a really cool, um, <laughs> there's a really cool theorem, not theorem, there's a really cool conjecture uh, okay. in, um, in black hole physics called the uh, no hair theorem. Uh, I don't know. I don't know where the actual the term hair here came from, but, but the idea is, I think we've said this a few times on the podcast, that generally when you think of a black hole, it can only have three uh, measurable quantities associated with it, right? So there's only three pieces of information that you can ever know about a black hole. One is its mass, right? One is its um, charge, charge, electric charge, and one is its angular momentum, right? Okay. How, it's, it's spin, basically. So, right? so those three properties are the only properties that can have all other properties get erased when things fall in. So that is, if you built a black hole out of a whole bunch of stars falling together uh, and it had a total mass of 10 times the mass of the sun, that would be exactly the same thing as if you had uh, a whole bunch of uh, vanities fall in yeah, or something like that um, and made the black hole. And there's no way to tell what it was made of or anything because all that matters is what's the total charge, the total angular momentum and total mass. And so any other information is, is, doesn't exist. And so they call any of this other possible information, any other uh, information you might glean from black hole hair for some reason, like. So I read that it was, I think I read something that it was like uh, the, the no hair ones or because their black holes are like bald spots. Like there's no interesting identifying information. So that's hair is, the no hair. Hair is interesting identifying information. Okay, I mean. Well, unique identifying information, the, right? There's the, no features that makes that help you identify something on it. Right. Says the but person like with a beautiful head of hair stuff. to the two bald people. <laughs> I'm telling you what the article said. Yeah, mm -hmm. the articles um, just happen to say that bald heads are really uninteresting. They're uninteresting and boring. Yeah. Um, I think that neglects the interesting head shape that's very important. <laughs> yes, but black holes have no head shape. They are oh, all no. shaped the same. Um, the question is, is that really true? Uh, because if that's true, we have a bit of a problem. There's been, for the last half a century, we've had this paradox in physics called the uh, black hole information paradox that worries us a lot. I love uh, a good paradox. Yeah, because in, in classical physics and in quantum physics, that are two of our favorite kinds of physics, of course. What um, other types are there? Uh, just relativistic physics, that's it. Okay. But in, so in most physics, information is something that is in some sense conserved. That is, you, you can never lose information uh, in, a, in a system. There's always, you can always, and, and the fundamental reason for that what, is like- What's an example of, of information in this context, Jim? What do you mean by- Well, what I mean is like, like the, if you have some set of particles, they all have you know, an arrangement or something. An arrangement, positions and velocities, roughly, right? And then that, um, in, in classical physics, they'd have positions and, and, and velocities. And if at any time you knew their positions and velocities now, you could reconstruct where they had been before, right? So the information about where they were before and their arrangement before is encoded in where they are now. Okay. And that's true both in classical physics and in quantum physics. In quantum physics, it's a little bit different. It, the, the information is not exact positions and, and velocities. It's wave, wave function functions and stuff. But the All information- All hand wavy. Right, it is. But it's, it's there's still, there's information there that can always be reconstructed from what you can learn later. Um, and so we really thought that the fundamental piece of the universe is that information isn't lost in the universe. 
Um, but in a black hole, it seems to be lost because when a thing falls into a black hole, it seems like all the information in that wave function or all the information about the velocity and everything, it's all gone. And so this is a paradox is it, well, what's really happening is, is the information lost or is it not? And so we've been looking for 50 years to try and understand whether there's some way in which black holes really are keeping that information. And if they're keeping it, I mean, when I say keep it, I mean, they have to eventually let it go because if they just keep it inside of their event horizon, then it's lost from the rest of the universe forever. So is, can, it, can it escape or not? And uh, some recent evidence or recent theoretical investigations, at least maybe not evidence, is suggesting that uh, maybe black holes do have hair. Maybe, they, maybe that's this simplification of mass, angular velocity, and, or angular uh, momentum and, and charge aren't the only things. So how does the, is that, I mean, we've heard of um, Hawking radiation, which is right. a mechanism by which a black hole could eventually evaporate. Does that have right. anything to do with how the information gets out? A little bit, right? So w when Hawking came up with this idea of Hawking radiation, it still didn't solve the information paradox because Hawking radiation is black body radiation is, is uh, uh, the kind of radiation we love to talk about that like the sun gives off and so forth. That is, it, basically it has no information uh, whatsoever. It's, it's isotropic. It goes off in every direction uniformly and it's spectrum, you know, the, the wavelengths of light and everything don't tell you anything about what's inside. The object uh, that it came from, except right. how hot it is, right? Except how hot it is, which is, is, uh, is not, is, is strictly proportional to or related to its mass. And so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't tell you any more information than you already had. It's about as but, boring as a bald head. <laughs> yeah. But it turns out that again, that this was those are based on very rough calculations back in the 70s and 80s by Stephen Hawking. It turns out maybe that's not right. That that maybe that information, if you wait long enough and, and really collect all of the light that's ever been given off by a black hole from the time it forms to the time it is totally evaporated, that you could from that reconstruct what went into the black hole in the first place. Okay. Um, and so is this a is this a is this an, a sort of academic uh of academic interest in term, or is it to have some sort of fundamental implications for universal conservation of information or something yeah, like that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, well, it's, so it's obviously it's of academic interest. What we want to know is information something that really is conserved uh, or not in the universe. Um, the nice thing about this is, is it's actually testable. Uh, so that is nowadays we can, obviously we can look at these, um, first of all, we can image the shadows of black holes and we can, see the gravitational waves coming from mergers of black holes. And those two things will be subtly different uh, in the cases of uh, hairy versus non-hairy black holes. And so uh, it looks like, not immediately, <laughs> but sometime in the near future, we'll be able to uh, test whether the, these bad boys are here suit or not. The merger, the merger of hairy black holes would look different than the merger of hairless black holes. Right, the in, gravitational in the, waves coming off of them the will be subtly waves. different. And the shadow of yeah. the event horizon oh. So the shadow of a hairy black hole would look different than the shadow of a hairless black hole. Just a little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, having said all of that, the, the calculations that they're doing now indicate that those differences would only be seen in these kind of black holes called extremal black holes. Uh, that is called what? Extremal. Extremal. I know. I was like, what is that word? Okay. Do you not like the word? Am I mispronouncing no. it? Do you want to pronounce no, it? No, no, no. You're pronouncing it correctly. I just was confused <laughs> hey, when I saw the, it. It's not the pronunciation I object to. It's the word. Go ahead. It's the word. Yeah, no, it's yeah. a word. I don't know. It's a, it's a word. Extreme. It's like taking an adjective. Like, I'm an Here's extreme, an adjective. Uh, attractive person. What? Extreme is already an adjective. And like adding an yes. L to something at the end, which I'm, as you know, frequently. <laughs> yeah, you do that every episode. Doing, just about, yeah. <laughs> Much to your annoyance, I do it to yes. turn a noun into a, an adjective. I don't see yeah. why you would add it to something that already is an adjective to change extreme to extreme old. It's a mathematical term uh, of or relating to maximal or minimal values or degrees of inclusiveness. Right, right. Because usually when you use the word extreme, okay. you just mean, you know, like really in one direction or, you know, uh, but okay. extreme old means actually like the maximum at, at the Oh, okay. Maximum so maybe possible. Or all right. possible. Anyway, <laughs> carry on. Anyway. You could use it. You could use it in the intro sometime. Huh? This will be the yeah. extremal. You can count on it that this yeah, is this the extremal podcast. astronomy <laughs> podcast. Um, but yeah, the extremal black holes just mean black holes that are essentially at or very close to 
you know, for a given charge or a given angular momentum, there's a minimum mass that you can have associated with those things. And if, and, and so it's, it seems like the calculations now are indicating that if you have one of those black holes that's at or near the extreme, uh, that those things might have hair. Now, it's possible that other ones do as well. It's just very difficult to tell because the it turns out, I don't know if you guys ever tried to do a calculation in general relativity. It's free. Not hard. general. Only when I had to for classes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but general relativity, it turns out Einstein's equations, which are the governing equations in general, yeah. are, are crazy complicated equations. And, yeah. Uh, and so even, what are we, a hundred years, more than a hundred years beyond the uh, origin of the general theory of relativity, there's still only a handful of exact analytical solutions that you can write down and every other ones are approximate solutions that we're still working on. Uh, and yeah. so uh, that's what's going on here. We're trying to work on those solutions that's and combine kind of them a little amazing. bit with quantum physics. And it's, uh, you know, it's what crazy. What was up with that guy? <laughs> <laughs> that dude was. He was an alien. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Just kidding. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought one of the cool things about this and they talked about it in one of the articles was um, just how it is like, well, it could be that there are these paradoxes with these theories, but it could also just be that like, we don't fully understand the mathematics. And so as we're poking right. at this, we're finding right. things that maybe help explain some of these discrepancies that we can mm -hmm. understand better. And it, it also is like, so this is a, a new, there's a new paper out about like finding these extremal conditions that some people, some there did some mathematical models. And I read the abstract for the paper and understood mm -hmm. like every five words, I think. <laughs> there was a ton of like just jargon. And yep. I was like, oh my God, I need a thesaurus. Well, that's yeah. why the astro quarks are here to try right. and yeah. <laughs> distill down this ridiculous. I agree. I read these things as well. Yeah. You think even the abstract, they would try really hard to like yeah. make it. Well, there was. To, some, to, of the, to... some of the journals are doing a nice like plain language summary right. now of the abstracts. Oh, and I, I don't like think that. you could do that for this. <laughs> I don't think these <laughs> authors could do that. I don't know. Yeah, and, uh, yeah no, you can in some sort of very high level way, but it reminds me also of uh, just to touch base since we've got a little bit of a math theme going on in this show with our, our mathematical theorem trivia, which we'll come to in just a, a few minutes after we talk about these craters in Germany. But mm -hmm. I, uh, you're familiar with Fermat's last theorem, yeah, which was this, this ridiculous thing that the French mathematician Fermat like jotted in his diary. It's like, oh, by the way, I figured out a proof to this uh, theorem, but I don't have time to jot it down right now. I'm off to the opera. And, <laughs> and that now was I'm it. Dead. And yeah, that one, that was it. And so it's this uh, x to the n plus y to the n plus z to the n is something as long as n is greater than three. I can't remember what the, the eight pi RT. theorem are. Embar <laughs> embarrassing myself. Eight pi GRT. <laughs> eight pi GRT. Uh, and um, it's something actually, it's an, it's an inequality that is relatively easily expressed yeah, uh, mathematically. If it's sort of a, yeah, it's a simple thing, but turns out proving it was insanely crazy. And there's no way, I don't think, in my very inexpert opinion in this topic that Fairmont had actually figured out a proof and just no. didn't have time to jot <laughs> no, it down. Because... Did. It's like the best practical joke of mathematics. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But somebody had, um, but somebody, won there was a prize for proving it and that was claimed uh, in the last uh, 10 or 20 years. And there's a book about it. And at the end, you know, sort of the story of, of this theorem and at the end, it has like the first page of the paper that's the proof of the theorem. And just like uh -huh. you were saying, Addy, it's like the abstract. It's like, okay, I'll read it. It's like, those are mostly English words. Yeah. <laughs> and talking about, Jim, what happens to information, to me, those words conveyed zero information. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. They might as well have been any other jumble the, of letters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. There was yeah. the information. We showed numerically that the ORI prefactor equals the Aratakis conserve charge. I'm like, okay, is that, I know. Is that an actual <laughs> yeah. That's part well, of the, well, yeah. Well, let's bring things a little bit cl back closer to home uh, before we talk about our, our uh, math trivia. So there's a, a story um, about craters in Germany. There aren't too many yeah. craters on the earth in the, to begin with, but there's a couple close to each other. There's not a huge, like craters on Earth are generally hard to find, right? Because it um, turns out Earth has weather and plate tectonics and all that stuff that tends to reshape the surface. Um, so we don't see that many craters. There are actually like a decent amount that are sort of, you can tell that the structure is still there 
Um, so, and we, we know that they're there, but they're usually like covered by other things or in the water and stuff like that. Um, but I guess there's a couple of structures that have been known for a little while in Germany. Um, I think there's something like 200-ish that we know of in the world, which is pretty low. If you compare that to like a square inch of the moon. Right. But, <laughs> Almost. <laughs> yeah. Right. So the moon covered in craters uh, of all different shapes and sizes and scales. But um, on Earth, they're much harder to find. So anyway, there's these, a pair of probably double craters that are uh, near Stuttgart, Germany, um, that we've you known mean, about. Both craters are double or there's just two craters? What do you mean? Oh, good, good clarification. There are two craters. There's a pair of craters. Okay, okay. Yes, um, that are relatively near each other um, in Germany. Um, and they're, um, I think, I don't remember exactly when they were discovered, but they've been known for a little while. And part of the reason they started figuring that out is because like some of the materials that were that are the buildings are built from like some of the old churches and stuff like that and the town are built from a really specific uh rock that is usually formed in impacts um mm -hmm. so it's like some of the materials they've been used to build are from these like you need highly energetic events to create these it's like sway swayvite right like the churches and stuff are built from this particular yeah yeah um so the two crate the two craters are about 40 kilometers apart from each other and i think one is like uh, 24 kilometers and one is four kilometers in diameter. Um, and for a while, like, so craters are rare on earth, they're hard to find. So for a long time, we've assumed that they were sort of coincidentally formed. Like you'd expect that maybe one hit and then they were formed at the same time because it's just like the odds of them forming independently. one location independently seem very low. And it's not that like earth in the past hasn't been hit a lot. It's just that like, it just seemed the statistics seem low. Wind and life and rivers and earthquakes yeah. and volcanoes and all this stuff tends to cover these things up. Yeah. And, and early on in Earth's history, it was hit all the time. Um, and so there would have been a lot more of this impact record, but it's been, it's now because of our atmosphere and all of that, we get hit less. Um, things calm down over time. We just don't get hit as much anymore with big things, thank goodness. Um, but anyway, so, but there's a new paper out. Um, that is, again, a very uh, jargony paper that I think I understood the abstract pretty well, um, because I do know some geology words, uh, but it's a very <laughs> geology heavy paper, um, but about how this, these two craters um, are probably actually independently generated. So how old so, are these craters? When did they form in the first place? Um, the middle Miocene. So it's like 14 which, or 15 million years ago or something like that. Yeah. So, so, they, so these they, are these are post dinosaur, but they're old, old, old. This isn't like yes. Tunguska or anything like that. Yeah, something like 14.8, 14.3 billion years. And so they think maybe million. one is about 14.3. Sorry, yeah, million. 14.3 an and one is 14.8 million mega yeah. annum. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they they so the the way that they determined because double craters are a thing and we actually do see double craters on the moon and on mars places where you do have a lot of craters because sometimes you'll and sometimes we even see these like crater chains yeah and those are usually like, due to like either well and you were gonna you mentioned shoemaker levy earlier right where you have yeah some like something that broke apart and it ends up with this chain of material hitting the surface I um, saw you've thing in an amazing movie that i saw called deep impact where the thing broke up and uh it was multiple there you go. impacts, although they weren't right oh, next wow. to each other. Yeah, yeah, broke up from, you know, astronauts blowing up a nuclear bomb on them. So any of these <laughs> things can break things yeah. up into multiple parts, tides, yeah. you know, or astronauts. Yeah. So we um, do see we do see structures on other bodies where you get like, you, as you were saying, it's like not coincidental, it's not chance coincidental, it's coincident because it was the same incident. Yes. It was two things that are, are, you know, were moving along together and they go bam, bam into Bam. yeah but they yeah. but now so the reason the way they were able to determine that these are probably not that is because of like aging them and determining that one is half a million years older than the other one 
Yeah, they've done a bunch of different analyses of like the geology of the region and some of the structures and, and looking at, um, so when you get impact, you obviously get impact melt usually, but you get a lot of fracturing of the surrounding rock. You also get sort of in extended regions, you get things like shaking and earthquake type effects. Mm -hmm. um, and also like just material gets moved around differently. So you get um, just material sort of injected a lot of times different places and what are called dikes, um, which is like a chunk of material that comes up inside of another material usually. Um, and um, so there's all sorts of interesting uh, layering happening here. Um, and they think that probably in some of the, and they look in some of the different regions. Um, and so it shows them that probably the Reese impact happened first, probably about 14.8 million years ago. Um, and then there was some the other- bigger one. That's, that's the, the 24 bigger kilometer one, one. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then there were some other things that disturbed the region a little bit. Um, and then there was the Steinham impact about 0.5 billion years ish later. There's look like a question mark next to that one. So, right. So these guys, these two craters, 24 and four kilometers across, you said. So typically mm -hmm. the thing making a crater ballpark ish about a tenth of the size of the crater. So it would have been something about. Uh, about the size of the deep impact impactor, in fact. Oh, so yeah, it was a significant event, uh, especially yes. if you had been in Germany at that time. Yes, yeah. Um, there cool. was one issue I had with uh, some of the language is that like they oftentimes in the article they in the article they referred to it as a binary asteroid impact, which like oh. I just had an issue with because you can get two things hitting that are related to each other and are probably part of an asteroid that aren't like a binary asteroid. Binary right? so is like get... the earth and the moon. It's two yeah. things orbiting each other. And we there are there are tons of binary asteroids out there. Something like at least half of asteroids are probably binaries, I think. I forget what the statistics we need to uh, call up Tracy Becker and ask her what the statistics are. But um, a large number of asteroids are binary or even tertiary. Ter trinary? Trinary. trinary? Mm -hmm. So where there's three orbiting um, sort of a common center of mass. But like, you can also just have a asteroid that gets broken up and the little bits are flying off, which is how we right. get a lot of our meteorites. Um, and those pieces fall down at the same time. So it doesn't have to be a, like a binary asteroid. Necessarily so. binary. That yeah. was my- And in this right. case, they seem to be, it's completely independent. And then, so the coincidence, as you were saying, Earth gets hit a lot in 500,000 years in between these two things. That's, that's sort of coincidental, but that's not like those are the only two things that hit the earth in that million years or so. And uh, the coincidence is maybe they're landing in a place where craters were able to sort of withstand the, the, the tests of time for 10 or 15 million years since they were formed. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It could yeah. just be that, yeah, this area, the, the material they're in somehow preserved it better. So yeah. it's interesting though. And I guess there have been some more of these sort of doublets found around the world, but they're still pretty rare. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, rare, mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with our trivia, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to read you the eight theorems. And as okay. I'm reading them, you're going to think which three you think I've made up. Okay. Okay. So here We're they all are. Can we just say true or false as we go? If you want, if that's what you want to do, sure. That's going to help us because then we're going to know. But oh, yeah, true. it does that's help okay. you. That's good. I, because... You can say true or false. I just won't tell you whether you're right or not. Until I'm done. <sighs> well, okay, I'm just not going to remember all of them at the end to say which are true and which are false. As we're going through, just make a note. Real or it's not real. Okay. 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 Jot it. You can jot it down. The Harry Ball theorem. The high dive theorem, the palm frond theorem, the ham sandwich theorem, the ugly duckling theorem, the non squeezing theorem, the squeeze theorem, and finally the court jester theorem. Okay. All right. So Addie, I feel pick like one all of those. those could be real. Only Eddie. five. Well, that's. I pick Ugly Duckling. As as one of the not real ones. Yeah. 
I pick, uh, as one of the not real ones, the high dive theorem. Okay. Uh, the ugly ducking theorem is real. The high dive theorem is not. Oh, one for Jim. Okay. okay. Plus, I've now like... eliminated ugly duckling from considerations for. Yeah. Okay. So I feel like either the either the the squeeze or the not squeeze. One of those is not real. The ugly duckling theorem is an argument that says that it's not possible to do any kind of classification without some sort of bias, and so I'd really love to like look into that in more detail because it's pretty interesting. So it's a mathematical yeah, it like theorem. A mathematical theorem that's weird. It's a mathematical theorem that says if you're going to categorize anything, somehow you're going to end up with some kind of. I don't. I don't understand. It looks it. really scary outside my house right now. Okay. Two more. Pick uh, um, the squeeze I, theorem is fake. That's what I was going to say too. The squeeze theorem is not fake. <sighs> it is sometimes called the two policemen and a drunk theorem. Uh, okay. Based if two policemen are escorting oh, a drunk, one. yeah, I know. <laughs> if two policemen are escorting a drunk prisoner between them, and both officers go to a cell, then regardless of the path taken, and the fact that the prisoner may be wobbling about between the policemen, the prisoner must also end up in the cell. Um, but <laughs> it really has to do with finding the limits of a mathematical function that is bounded by two other mathematical functions. I was say, is that like a random walk, but you're squeezing it? <laughs> so, the, so the two mathematical functions, if they approach some limit and there's another mathematical function in between them, it gets squeezed into that and you can okay. figure out what the limit of that is. But uh, um, so- Fine, then the no squeezing theorem is fake. It's also true. I think that one's real, yeah. All right. So you've each guessed three, and Addie's over for three. Well, Addie two. didn't. No, Addie only didn't. Get, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, What's your third guess, more. Addie? Uh, what are the ones that are left? Uh, Harry Ball, Palm Frond, Ham Sandwich, Ugly Duckling, and Court Jester. We already know. Second one. The high. Uh, the Palm Frond. Yeah. You're correct. So it's time. Yes. You're you're each one for three. Great. So I feel pretty good about myself. So the Harry Ball theorem is real. Uh, the ones I made up were the high dive theorem, the palm frond theorem, and the court jester theorem. Mm. Uh, I thought uh, maybe the court jester. I knew ham the, sandwich had to be one. The ham sandwich <laughs> is a real theorem. The Harry Ball is a real theorem. Uh, and it's somewhat kind of related to this idea of the black, the hairy black hole, because some of these articles about the hairy black hole are talking about like combing it. And the, the Harry Ball theorem, just to wrap us up, is that if you, you can't perfectly comb a ball that's covered with hair without ending up with a cowlick, basically, you're gonna end up with some oh. kind of mess. Yeah. It actually oh, ties yeah. in with things like the magnetic field of the sun, you end up you know, with some mess at some point. Mm, so, I like that. Mm. Yeah. My cat has a cowlick. Well, congratulations. You have almost completed another episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Write us a review on that Reddit Wall Street board and tell <laughs> everyone to subscribe to our podcast on account of the squeeze theorem, mm. like a short squeeze. Mm -hmm. Be sure mm -hmm. to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to get all our updates and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Walk About the Galaxy, where you can see most of our episodes, some of our bloopers, and all of our music videos. Catch up on old episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at walk underscore the underscore galaxy. And ask us questions anywhere using hashtag AskWTG. Our theme music was composed by Richard Jerusik. Thanks to our listeners in Switzerland and around the world. Stay safe. I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Addie Dove. And I'm Paul Giamatti. <laughs> We're the Astroquark signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy.